All right, well, I am very excited to start our afternoon's activities. I feel like we ended the morning with um, a really inspirational conversation or couple of conversations about the power that individual leaders can have in shaping their communities. And as you know, we're sticking with the, the theme of the importance of focusing on people and really lifting up the leaders in our communities um, and lifting everyone communities so that we can focus on the things um, that make our rural towns, our bustling urban centers, and the back roads of the hill country vibrant and resilient, uh, not just for today, but for future generations. So I'm very excited to introduce Carmen Yanis Pulido, who is the executive director of Go Austin, Vamos Austin, who is doing incredible things in the Eastern Crescent of the city of Austin uh, to uplift that community, to focus on health, to focus on resilience and responding to change, to focus on responding to all of the emergent threats that we've been dealing with over the last 18 months and well beyond, um, increasing housing prices, winter storm URI, access to clean, safe drinking water, wastewater issues, flooding, you name it, and it's not unique to Austin. We're facing these issues all across the Hill Country. So Carmen is going to deliver our keynote address. And then we really wanted to broaden the conversation about how the lessons that she's learning and seeing, um, the momentum that she's building on the Eastern Crescent of Austin are being played out in the same way in other communities in the Hill Country. So I'm very excited. We have former county judge Donna Klager with us from Burnett County and city council member C Connie Barron from the city of Blanco, uh, who will come up on stage and join uh, Carmen in a, a conversation about how these same stories are playing out and being driven by them in their own communities. So please join me in welcoming Carmen Yanis Pulido to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I have to engage a little bit because everybody's blood has now rushed to their tummies, and uh, we're all ready to probably enter into nap time in a couple hours here. Um, but we won't because you have so much exciting content uh, ahead. Um, I'm very honored to be asked to speak to you all today. Um, and also, I just, uh, well, a couple of things. Um, it's not right to be out in the hill country and talking about this incredible land without having some land acknowledgement. And um, as a mixed person from, the, from central Texas, from the hill country, uh, who also has some native roots to this area, uh, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that we've had stewards on this very, very special land for a long time. Uh, some of the names you all may have learned or know of the Caddo people, the Tonkawa, the Comanche, uh, the Karankawa, the Lipan Apache, um, and also the Coahuilteca, who go all the way to San Antonio and northern Mexico, which is where some of my folks come from. Um, it's also important to recognize that this part of central Texas has been incredibly sacred and important to lots of people for as long as people have been here, um, and that's a long time. Uh, so, um, you know, it's less about land belonging to one, any one particular group of people um, but recognizing that people just like water, just like air, we move around uh, and we live off the land. So I wanted to acknowledge that before we get started. Uh, the other thing I would like to acknowledge is hybrid conference for the win. Is this not the best? I mean, it is beautiful to see you all here, but stuff happened. I'm an executive director of a nonprofit, so those of you who know, some stuff tends to happen that you have to handle. Um, and I was able to tune in right at 8.45. And let me tell you, the lighting was almost better virtually. I mean, it looked like you were in a lit conference arena. Um, and the sound was great. And I just have to say that because, you know, I'm an Austin kid. So that means high probability of being the child of performers. So my mother always taught me, you know, when the stagehands do everything perfectly right, when your sound person is perfect, your technician, when your lighting is perfect, nobody knows they exist. Right, so I just want to give a shout out to your incredible tech. 
and sound crew because this actually enabled many more of us to participate and some probably some of you out in the hill country who aren't with us in this room are able to participate and um, we can't go back to a place where not everybody could participate. It wasn't working for us. As much as I think sometimes we thought we missed it, um, I have really learned how incredibly ableist it is to expect everybody to be able to rush and convene all the time. So it's beautiful to have this hybrid option. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today about buzzwords uh, and making them real, particularly resilience and sustainability uh, and leadership. And what that actually means, because I'm afraid we're in this place where we're facing climate crisis and we're dealing with environmental issues that, and human issues that many of us have known about for a really long time. Uh, but, but things are coming to a head. And unfortunately, the, some of these buzzwords that can be holistic, encompassing umbrellas for the kind of work we need to do, uh, they lose their meaning when they become diffuse and far away from the grassroots, from the front lines. And in progressive little Austin, Texas especially, we are unfortunately guilty of a lot of rhetorical policies and rhetorical um, efforts that don't translate into action. Um, we've seen a lot of really successful action, and I'm sure you all see this in your communities too, but when you just come out talking about climate resilience to everyday regular people, you lose most of your crowd. So what does it actually mean, and what is sustainability? What is sustainability in the 2020s? Because we're in a new reality, right? A lot of new stressors. So I'm gonna share a little bit about GAVA. I'm gonna throw two, text, through two slides at you that are really texty, so I apologize in advance. They're not all like this. But our mission is to organize and mobilize community power for health equity. We reduce barriers to health while increasing institutional capacity to respond to the people most impacted by historic inequities. Our vision is a health equity vision, pure and simple. We want to live in a world where you can't predict my health outcomes by looking at the zip code that I live in, where I cannot predict your health outcomes by your race, where we are not so dependent on income to determine people's access to healthy living, and all of the other things, all of the other isms and identities and issues that systemically get in the way of being healthy. So we work on increasing access to physical activity, improved nutrition in specific neighborhoods. We started in Dove Springs in Southeast Austin, which is right uh, where Onion Creek, Lower Onion Creek and Williamson Creek come together. Uh, and we uh, have expanded, we also have been working in other parts of South Austin for years, and in the last few years started working in North Central Austin. Um, so we, we work really specifically on access to healthy food and physical activity building community power and fostering uh, neighborhood stability. We know nothing's truly permanent. So when we say permanency, we're talking about the lasting relationships and stability that allow us to be healthy. This is my textiest slide, but you can see we organize, right? We mobilize, we connect people to resources. We help people start their own programming when the programming out there doesn't work for them. Uh, we connect organizations, we provide training, res uh, resources, support. We develop new and existing networks of community leaders. And when we talk about neighborhood stability, we're identifying specific policies and tools and programs that are anti-displacement related, which is really, really hard <laughs> in a hot real estate market. Um, but we're also looking at ways to increase people's income, and especially in the nonprofit industrial complex, how are we capturing more of the value that's being invested in our communities? How are we paying people in the community to do the work that needs to be done? Um, how are we capturing value and actually increasing incomes and people's uh, access to increasing their economic mobility? So we started out, oh wow, y'all really probably can't, <laughs> I don't know if you could see this, but we began as a childhood obesity initiative. So this middle map here, this is the 78744 Dove Springs, Southeast Austin area, right? And those hot spots are where we, we were seeing you know, 70, 80% of children in these area middle schools overweight and obese. So uh, go back about 10, 15 years to the mid-aughts, obesity was a major buzzword in public health and in philanthropy in general. And so uh, this was where a lot of attention was going. We we're basically looking, can we turn the dials now for children to avoid a worsening health crisis that we're seeing? 
South Austin to the right, and then Runberg area, uh, North Austin to the left. So we started working in these areas, and we were very successful in five years of actually stabilizing adult BMIs, uh, meaning they didn't go up among people who were close to our efforts. And these were things like, I mean, we weren't measuring people's food, we weren't uh, you know, prescribing individual fitness programs. These were park improvements, lighting improvements, pedestrian infrastructure, uh, farm stands, uh, making the, the farmer's market, which wasn't quite accessible geographically, economically, or culturally for a lot of the folks we were working with, to neighborhood farm stands in the apartments and schools, healthy corner store initiatives, um, community safety efforts, which while some was around crime prevention, and we found the best crime prevention and reduction was in park lighting, actually, uh, most of the safety was around traffic. Most people were afraid of getting hit by a car or their kids getting hit, and that was limiting a lot of mobility. So five years of this work, we were very successful, and it became very clear to our funders, which our first funder was uh, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, that we were really working in social determinants of health. So social determinants of health is now the buzzword in population health, the buzz term, S-D-O-H, because it basically talks about how 80% of what determines your health is not the health care that you get in the doctor's office. It's actually where you live, work, learn, worship. It's where your environment is. It's all of the other things that influence your life, um, what your family has access, what you have access to, the land around you, the environment, the, the contamination levels, your experience with racism, with colonization, uh, gender, resources around you, school, your access to early childhood. So these really holistic things that we were finding in the place-based space um, are really around social determinants of health. But where is the first place I ever heard us talking about where we live, work, learn, play, and pray? It was the environmental justice movement 30, 35 years ago. It was uh, black, Latino, Latinx, Native American, and Asian people of color getting together around the United States and showing that not only were people of color so much more disproportionately exposed to environmental toxins and pollution at the point of extraction, at the point, to the point of dumping, right? Uh, but that the environmental movement was not funding the environmental justice movement that less than 2% of environmental funding was going to the environmental justice movement. So who was funding the environmental justice movement? What sector? Do we know? Anybody know? Health care close, public health. Public health was funding the environmental sector. So we've come full circle. Uh, and as we've worked on social determinants, how do we get here? How do we get to climate resilience? Well. The neighborhoods we work in are disproportionately impacted by chronic disease and other health disparities. They're also downstream. So when I mentioned Dove Spring, Southeast Austin, it's, it's in a bowl where Onion Creek and Williamson Creek um, came, across, came together. So I mentioned that um, you know, we were evaluated really robustly, UT Health Science Center out of Houston, UT School of Public Health here in, uh, in Austin, five longitudinal studies of our work stabilizing adult BMIs, really impressive, right? Child BMIs still went way up. And our funders kind of freaked out. But there were some omitted variables in our evaluation. What wasn't registered in the study was that there were two catastrophic floods in those five years in these neighborhoods. And children experienced that trauma of being stuck at an elementary school campus. Uh, where their parents couldn't get to them, of not having ingress and egress in and out of their neighborhood, of having to be rescued off their roofs, of losing 200 classmates overnight, entire neighborhoods being wiped off the map. Um, those were the 2013 uh, Halloween floods and 2015 Halloween floods. Um, the 13 flood started with a funnel cloud out in Driftwood, Texas. So right out here, we, we're literally downstream. And as somebody who lives downstream, I just want to say thank you. Um, and thank you. And thank you to everyone who is in the Hill Country doing this work, because I've learned that one of the most effective things we can do for flood mitigation in Southeast Austin is talk about land acquisition and com conservation upstream. But folks in Dripping Springs may not be thinking about us when they're trying to get their most valuable assets out of the watershed. 
So we have to find relationships and ways of talking to each other and sharing lessons. That hotspot map I showed you on the very edge, that's obesity. The next one over is demolitions. So those are demolitions of homes. You can see all over central East Austin, lots of demolitions, central Austin, lots of demolitions. That hot spot, lower, lower right hand corner, that's Onion Creek and the buyout areas. And then in 2018, we learned about Atlas 14. And um, when I picked my jaw up off the lunch table, um, as I was told by the Office of Sustainability ally I was talking to at the city of Austin, that our 500-year floodplain was going to become our 100-year floodplain, and so on. I said to myself, it's no longer ethical for us to be doing any community organizing in these neighborhoods without addressing this issue, because there is no healthy eating and physical activity when you have community-wide trauma from climate shocks and stressors. And we're not just dealing with floodplains, we're dealing with localized flooding issues. And that's where the real inequities come in for us on a municipal level, right? But regionally, these waters are affecting all of us. And this is the entire I-10 corridor. So our, our Harris County folks, our Brasoria County folks, everybody needs to be part of this discussion as to what does this look like? The solutions have to come from the people who are experiencing it and the technical experts we can get at the table. We use one-on-one -on -one conversations and relationship building to surface issues. Because in health equity and racial equity, I think our institutions are getting better at talking about how the people closest to the problem are closest to being able to define the solution. I think that's very true in all of our communities, right? We're different kinds of communities. So you can't scale and replicate every successful initiative. I would never expect to deploy the exact same strategies we're using in Austin, even in two parts of Austin. Y'all know the north-south divide is real. So I wouldn't be coming out to Blanco or Burnett County and assuming that I know what kind of social infrastructure is going to drive a movement because the people there know what it's about, right? But I'm gonna take it a step further and say that true equity is about directly impacted communities defining the problem, not just the solution, but the problem. Because you don't really know what the real problem is. You don't know what the root cause is until you get in there and start talking to people who are living it, right? Um, so this is what it used to look like. I had a slide with like a huge collage of our old gatherings and it actually started to make me nervous. About three months into 2021, I was like, this doesn't feel good anymore. My, I'm, not, I'm not as ready to be packed in a giant conference. But you know, this is what, we, what it looks like for us is meeting in the school, meeting in the church. You know, yes, we have a huge nonprofit infrastructure in Austin that I know lots of towns and cities don't have, but at the end of the day, it's not about the nonprofits. It's about where people, regular people gather. Where are you meeting people where they're at and sitting side by side? So we started redefining resilience as response and responsibility. When something happens, how do I respond? To my household, to my neighbors, there's someone I know I need to check on down the street because it's an elder with medical equipment, right, if the power's out. It's that kind of really local, how do I take responsibility? How do I maintain, if I'm lucky enough to own property, how can I manage and steward my land and water in a more responsible way, right? And then our agencies, our state and county and city agencies, how do they respond? How do they take responsibility? That frame actually allowed us immediately to start having real world conversations with public servants, residents, regular folks. Because resilience, what is resilient? You know, it, it can take you in a million directions. And sustainability. Yes, it's about the environment. Yes, it's about funding. It's also about equity, right? It's a three-legged stool. And it's supposed to be about people. Because the people who take care of our people are tired. They were tired before this pandemic. They're tired now. They're burnt out right? Anybody who is doing anything for their community has had extra weight. And so therefore, any care and resources and replenishing we can give to the people who are our caretakers, our stewards, our leaders, is going to go right back out into their community, right? Think of the most dedicated people you know in your community. They're going through it too. They've got kids in remote school, or they've got you know, in-laws who lost their job. They've got 
deaths in the family. There are things going on with them too, but they keep showing up, right, until they can't anymore. But if we restore and replenish and renew our leadership, those resources go right back out into the community. So that's actually a way that we're shifting the way we're looking at our work now. We're looking at what does it look like to actually nurture as much as we uh, provide the basics. Like, where is the quality over the quantity, over the productivity in our results, the metrics, as we do our strategic planning? How are we setting metrics that matter to the community first? Because things have to get better, right? Y'all know this. You can't just have plans and declarations. Things have to visibly get better for people for them to stay engaged. We have to recognize that people can't maintain, we can't keep just going with awesome amazing metrics and just blowing everything out of the water with the most suboptimal conditions some of us are dealing with, right? So we gotta equalize risk. And I always quote Grace Lee Boggs because she's one of my favorite teachers. She passed away a few years ago at 100 years old. Um, she was uh, an incredible Chinese American uh, thinker, philosopher, organizer, activist, scholar, and she lived uh, most of her life in Detroit. And this was her, actually her, um, her advice to the Occupy movement when it was growing, um, was to say, you know, you got a long way to go. Um, because there is a discord with the way resources are distributed in our world, but the systems we all rely on, um, you know, we're all tied up in this. This is a much longer road we're talking about, and it's actually a shift in consciousness about how we take care of each other in our communities. So her advice was to do something real. Do something local, however small, and don't diss the political systems, but understand their limitations. Elections are important. We're gonna have some electives up here, it's really important, right? But there are limitations to our political systems. There is so much that's never going to happen at the government level, uh, at the corporate level, it has to happen at the community level, and that's, I think, something that we can all get behind. So. Our mission hasn't changed as GAVA. We still care about exercise and healthy food and outdoor play and green space and mindfulness of exposure, but it's a little different now. Now it's exercise for mental health. It's healthy food for sustenance and sharing food. It's breaking isolation for social support to get us through the toxic stress load of the stuff we're dealing with. It's mindfulness of exposure, not just because screen time is bad for your eyes and keeps you sedentary, but also because the news might just make you go mad, right? So it's actually, it's a different kind of frame of wellness that we're looking at. Wellness to get us through to the next step and to stay fresh and to keep our movements regenerated. So uh, we also talk about the allostatic load. You know, stress has an impact on the body. It's part of what's so nice about being out here is that we can disconnect for a second and actually ground ourselves uh, before we go back to the work. So it's a different, different way of looking at it and also recognizing that many people are benefiting from your work. Many people are benefiting from our work. It's not just, hopefully it's the most directly impacted people in your community first who feel a difference, but your governments certainly are appreciative because they have huge gaps they can't fill, right? Investors who are interested in the real estate of where you are, they benefit big time from the work that we're all doing, right? Emerging leaders that you bring up, you won't ever know the value of your mentorship sometimes. Uh, what people take away from it. And these are all different interests. They might not all be aligned. But this is where we have to get, out, get on the balcony and talk about the bigger implications of our work, especially over the long term. The last thing I want to say is just that leadership is all about leveraging networks. You can't really see, but I put a, a little diagram. You know, there's different kinds of networks. You can look at network analysis and pictures and hubs and spokes and concentric circles and clusters and all of those kinds of things. But the point is, our networks are incredibly valuable. They're not only, um, you know, not only can we see and do more across uh, a much greater breadth through our networks, um, but we are more agile. We can adapt, we can do things differently, we can turn on a dime. Um, and I have been so pleased to learn 
um, more about these uh, incredible people that will be on this panel with me. I'm not surprised that they were uh, elected to their positions uh, multiple times in some cases um, in the past because, uh, and, and currently, just because um, true leaders know how to work their networks. True leaders have a following um, and that following isn't necessarily subordinate. In fact, most of the time, it's horizontal, it's complex, it's people who know each other, it's the trust that is built, and everything is running on trust. That's a lesson my dad gave me, you know? We, sometimes I don't think, I think it's frightening sometimes to think about how much of our world runs on trust, but it really does. We, we're trusting each other to carry through, regardless of what agency we work with, and so, in doing that, we gotta trust that we're all doing okay. And that's why it's ever more important to take care of ourselves and also take care of each other. Um, because networks really truly are what change the world, um, in, the, in the words of Margaret Mead. So, uh, I've managed to leave all my notes at my seat, that's cool. So <laughs> Catherine, if you will bring me my, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna, well, in my, All right, so um, I'm super excited to welcome up here, thank you, current uh, Blanco County, uh, uh, sorry, Blanco City Council member, uh, uh, Connie Barron, there she is, up to the panel. And we also have former Judge Donna Klager as well, who is the current, uh, current head of the um, Community Resource Center, of T Community Resource Centers of Texas which let me just tell you, having been working in climate resilience for the last couple of years, I am so grateful to know about this organization because uh, it's proof that there is not a prescribed way to do these things. There are certain outcomes we gotta reach and what is in your community is what is gonna work. So we're gonna tr tr turn to a panel here. Did I read you? <laughs> yes. Not working for the county. Margaret Mead is your favorite. See, I should have put the perfect. So y'all, everybody knows the Margaret Mead quote, right? Never doubt. Everybody knows it, right? That a small caring group of individuals can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Yeah, so not perfectly uh, verbatim, but it's, it's really true. Uh, none of us would be here doing the work we're doing without the really dedicated work of maybe a small group of individuals that's not actually so small after all. So thank you all so much, and we're going to get into our next part here. Uh, give me just one moment. Excellent. So as you all know, the, the topic of uh, the theme of this entire um, summit is leadership, and we're um, particularly speaking more in detail um, about our, how we are building resilience, right? How we're pulling these different communities to do this. Of course, in the Hill Country, um, as Catherine put it well, we faced a bit of a perfect storm <laughs> of sorts, um, where most of us are very familiar with flooding, um, probably more than we would like to be. Um, and we all, in Texas, went through an incredibly historic winter storm, which may not be the last one to see, right? Since it looks like our jet stream has a bit of a, a hernia. Um, so it, that, that could happen again. We learned a lot, right? Um, all of us are dealing with record-breaking development, and I almost want to apologize to the people around Austin, because I know you all are feeling all the explosive growth that we're feeling, but then again, I'm not the one doing it. Uh, I just, I know it, and I feel it, and... Um, and I, am, I want you all to know, too, that I'm pushing my own city officials to think more comprehensively in a five-county or 11-county area instead of um, believing that we are on an island and we can just, you know, deal with land use on our own. But this is something we're all experiencing, the costs and, and benefits of that. So how are we protecting health, economic security, uh, prosperity, environmental resilience while we plan... Um, or confront the lack of planning in this growth and explosion. And, um, and so I'm gonna start here with Judge Klager. Are you, do you still go by Judge? Yeah, I, I'll go by whatever you 
<laughs> I'd say once an elected county judge, always a judge, no? Um, so so I, I just want to, uh, obviously, if you all are familiar with Judge Klager's work um, or have read your, your speaker bios, you know um, she brings a background of quite a lot of community leadership. Um, and uh, so I would love to hear a little bit more about um, how that, how your collective work and that journey in particular got you to the CRCs and what are some of the biggest needs that you have seen um, as you've come across them? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. I, I love your speech and right on. It's like you're talking about community resource centers every day. So uh, I'm an elected official and uh, dealt with a lot of people of all different ages and races over the years. And in 1990, we were having some challenges as far as transportation and access to services. Uh, Senator Frazier helped us, uh, Mark Seraph with AOL. I worked with him and I was the county treasurer. And so I was in charge of indigent health care. And it's very real, the indigency in our rural communities as long as well as in our metropolitan areas. We, um, we had a need, and in a rural community, a lot of the regional and state agencies don't come out to our communities. And so our, our idea was a one-stop shop for community services. So if we could provide an office where CAPCOG Area on Aging and uh, Blue Bonnet Trails, all the different areas that we needed resources, if we could give them free office spaces in a building and provide them with computers and desks and everything, all they had to do is pick up a suitcase and bring it in and set up their own appointments. Well, it became, um, we, we partnered with uh, Texas Housing Foundation, which is in workforce housing, and Back in 1992, I think, I mean, we've been in partnership, 2004, sorry. Uh, we've been in partnership for a long time, and the, and the model works. Uh, DSHS comes in, HHSC, our probation departments are even in there from the county. We have AARP, rental assistance, uh, all, all kinds of areas. And so over the years, I ran for county judge and got out of the business and back in the business after I retired. So we now have locations in Lano, in, in uh, Johnson City, in Blanco County, in Marble Falls, and in Liberty Hill. And actually, uh, all of our agencies, are our buildings are full of agencies that are providing services. We go in and we meet, we put advisory boards together in each of the communities and the communities tell us what they need, where the gaps are, and we work with the local governments. And so it has proven a very, very successful model such that we have, I now have six communities in the state of Texas who are very, very interested. So we're gonna start replicating and working with communities in, in helping them build what their resource looks, looks like. And as I understand it, your six new sites aren't even all restricted to the Hill Country. You're, you're all over Texas. We're all over Texas. So we're, we're down in South Texas and Middle Texas, er, everywhere in North Texas. And so uh, we have developed the program and we have, the, we have the policies and procedures and how to put it together and work. And uh, so I think that's more important is the community, the communities are coming because they hear about the works. And when people come in for need, COVID, the, the ice storm was amazing because we, we were busy. In the last six months, we have seen and calls helped over 42,000 people in four little communities. We have food pantries in it in two of our facilities. We have, uh, you know, pregnancy resource centers. So some of the agencies live with us and some come, just come once a week. Texas workforce, helping people find jobs is what we do. They give us free computers and assistance and training and helping people uh, in our communities. So. 
It can use meeting rooms, conference rooms, all day and all night. And it's a community resource center. So uh, it's their center to come and we are there to serve and we connect people. So we're not providers, we're connectors. That's it, leveraging. And I have a lot of brochures in the back. If you're interested in learning more, pick up a brochure and give me a call. Yes, that is a beautiful display, by the way, I have to say. If you haven't walked by that, that table, um, Council Member Barron, uh, you also have um, faced a number of, of challenges as an elected official and just as a community member and leader, um, including the Blanco River flooding, uh, the winter storm that we all experienced, the pandemic, et cetera, new developments and Permian Basin pipeline. So it's never a dull moment, I imagine. How are you leveraging your network? How are you engaging to get through this stuff? Well, I'm very lucky to be in a fabulous community like Blanco, and I think all of you have that sense of community wherever you are. But I will touch and give you an example of one, and there's someone here, Wayne Gosnell, who remembers it well. But the Memorial Day flood, my husband and I lived not far from the river. We could see it rising, and we thought, well, you know, don't know what's going to happen, but we lived in Houston. So we thought, we'll just make it like a hurricane party. We'll grab a couple of bottles of wine, some flashlights, a couple of pillows. We'll get out of the house because we don't want to be one of those people who has to be rescued at 2 a.m. because we didn't get out at 4. So we um, decided to go to Gym of the Hills where I happen to be a board member and a health and fitness educator and trainer there as well. And it's up high. So on the way, one of the then city council members who knew I had connections at Gem of the Hills, called me just as my husband and I were pulling up and said, do you know anybody who can open up Gem of the Hills because we have to start evacuating and we have no shelter? Funny you should mention that. <laughs> so we opened it up and people started coming in. So the next thing, I have a phone call from the local scoutmaster who says, I hear Gem of the Hills is open, what do you need? I need cots. He goes and gets his Boy Scout troops who can get their camping cots and he brings them up. So I happen to have the phone number of owners of a local restaurant, Redbud Cafe, fabulous place. The Breegers, I said, we're here, I have people coming, we have no food. What can you do? Well, we're stuck at the restaurant, we can't get home, but we can get to you. So they brought bread and coffee and chicken salad and food and beverages and paper products and that's how it began. And then someone from our Good Sam Thrift Center said, what do you need? And we said, we need dry clothes and we need towels and we need blankets because people are coming in soaking wet. So they opened up the Good Sam store. They gathered up piles of clothing and whatever and they brought it up there. And we slept 65 people that night um, people managed to find their way, and volunteers showed up, and retired nurses showed up, and it was an amazing response, which continued on for a week, during which time the recovery, we had a brand new mayor who had just been elected and sworn in that first, or the second Tuesday in May before the flood, and uh, we began afterwards, as I like to say, drawing boxes and putting people in them. We need somebody to handle donations. We need somebody to handle feeding and housing our rescue workers. We need somebody to handle, and we all worked our networks. We got on the phone and we called people we knew who had some network of their own in certain areas, and we fed and housed search and rescue workers and cleanup crews for almost two weeks, three, day, three meals a day and overnight lodging. Meanwhile, people were rebuilding and folks were heading out and helping people clean up and mop up and dig out from under. And uh, it was quite a miraculous thing to see, even in the uh, winter flood when we didn't have any water, I mean the freeze, excuse me, when we didn't have any water for a while. As soon as we knew we didn't have water, those people who were outside the city limits, that I always say city limits are a nice barrier you can use if you want to, but it doesn't define your community. And all those people outside of our city water supply who had wells that were working and had water offered to bring it in, to have people come out and take showers, load up their water, do whatever it is they needed to do, with their friends and folks in the city until the water supply was restored. So getting to know your neighbors, having their phone numbers, if I ever lose my phone, I'm dead meat. 
um, because I know I have phone numbers in there I'll never find again. But knowing people, I, I lobbied for 10 years, and when I would see members of the legislature, I used to always tell them, I don't know a lot of stuff, but I know a lot of people who know a lot of stuff. And uh, I'm not afraid to ask. So uh, that's what building community means to me and what I try very hard to encourage and certainly I benefit from as well. Spoken like a true leader. Um, so I'm gonna switch topics now to the topic of being an elected official and, and making that transition. So um, for both of you actually, um, tell us a little bit about just the journey of, of actually going from you know doing work in your community to actually running for office. And if you could wind back the clock and tell you, give your former self a little bit of heads up or advice or insight, you know, what, what would be something you would share? Sign my recall petition. <laughs> Surely she jests. Oh, well, well you, you, you could think on it if, you, if you'd like, Donna. I don't know if you... Go ahead. Okay. Well, first of all, I am the most apolitical person you know. I mean, I, I had never even voted before I was asked to run for county... Uh, treasure and I was like I owned a children's store and I had ran the chamber and library and all kinds of things but I hated that store so much when they came in and asked me would you run for treasure I said yes what do I have to do well you know you have to run HR and you have to you know do the bookkeeping for the county and everything I said yes sign me up well I won I mean that was very interesting. And so because it was some party changes in our, in our community, so the chances of us winning was very slim, but I ran. You know, it was the best thing in my life, uh, meeting with elected officials and understanding how government works was something that was brand new for me. So I, I learned firsthand in how to work with the communities at the state level and federal level even. And so, um, again, when we were working with the community resource centers, uh, it was running well and uh, because I had already set up and I had transferred it over to the Texas Housing Foundation, our whole nonprofit. And so I was going to go back and run the community resource centers and take, take, take care of them. And I was asked to run for county judge. And I'm like, well, this is Burnett County. Women aren't on the commissioner's court. You know, never in the history of. So, um, wow. So uh, one of my commissioners, uh, well, all, all but one commissioner asked me to run. So I ran. I was like, what well, all you can do is try. And if you don't win, I'm still going to do what I was going to do anyway. And I won. And I mean, it was like crazy. Why and do you so think you won? I, Can I ask? Why do you think you won? I won because I was very involved in the community. I, you know, ran the chamber. We were the library. We worked with, we set up new events. I started the drag boat races. Maybe that's why. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we were very involved, a group of people very involved in our community, and our whole family was. So it was a whole, whole community of people working together. So uh, I won because I worked with some incredible people who were very, uh, who wanted to work together and be part of the government. And so we were. And so I was, um, I was very blessed uh, to have a, a great commissioner's court who was very supportive. And we did a lot of things and water issues. And actually, that's where I met Kristen Meese the first time. Uh, is uh, through the water problems that we had, the floods and the drought. I have to say, I kind of think a flood is a lot easier because the waters come down and then they go away. But a drought doesn't. And I had some pictures, and I can't find them, but Lake Buchanan was a stream. And if, if you know, I, I spoke a lot through Central Texas about that. So passions became the reality of people working together and working, again, what are your needs? We have a thousand square miles in Burnett County. Every community had different needs, but they all overlapped in some areas. So we, you know, I learned that, you know, first you take care of the crisis, but then you fix the crisis. So it doesn't come 
again. So I spent a lot of time aggravating LCRA over the years about dredging the lakes and about floods and different things and about, you know, making sure we didn't have a drought. But that was, you know, very... Very interesting. Uh, I was very, very involved in politics at that time and worked very closely with our state uh, legislatures, and we made a lot of really good decisions, and I'm very fiscally conservative. So, you know, when I, I served eight years, and then when I left, there was a money to take care of things. And so, you know, you do a lot of things as a county judge that not everybody agrees with. Um, you know, uh, we built a jail. And whew, that was the fullest my courtroom's ever been. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you learn to make decisions that are hard, but that are best for the future of the community. So you learn, it of, don't do what's just right today. Look for the future. What are you going to need in the future? Don't spend a little bit of money here when you can take care of the next 20 or 30 years. And so um, it, was a, it was a lot of uh, work. If you haven't run and you're interested, do it. All you can do is lose, and you, you know, and there's winners and losers. But I will tell you, it is all in or not in because you have to believe in your cause, in your community, and you have to be able to listen and be wrong and be able to serve the community that what their needs are. So, Thank you, Donna. Honey. Well, I think what Donna said is, is very true. You, if you're involved, if you're thinking about running, and even if you're not, be involved in your community at every level that you can imagine. If it's at the, the library, and it's too often, and I face this, we face it in our community, even in a small community, there tends to be a silo mentality. Somebody will find one organization that they're very active in, but that's all in for that organization or that church or that group, and it doesn't cross over. So sometimes there, it can be a little narrow in the view of what's going on among others in the community. So if you really want to know where the needs are, get outside of your comfort silo and volunteer in some other places. Meet some other people, do some other things. Um, be involved in other organizations. Go to every fundraising event you can manage to go to because they're, they're going on all the time. And if you do that, you really then, you do know a lot of people. And when somebody comes to you and says, will you run? As a number of people did, it's, you feel like, well, if there are enough people there that have faith in my ability to do this job, then I'm willing to try to do that. And then you find an awesome campaign manager who is an incredible organizer and a great communicator, and you do what you can do to get the word out. But it's, um, it's daunting. It, it's much more <laughs> daunting than you can imagine. And what I would say is that if you are elected, and even if you're not, if you're thinking about running, go to your city council meetings or your county commissioner meetings, or your planning and zoning meetings, or any of your governmental entities. And now, because so many of them are virtual as well, if you can't physically be there, you can either tune in, a lot of them are recorded and put on the website later, watch them, find out what's going on, and then even better, be the person who tells other citizens what went on. You become the person who knows what's going on with city government. And what I try to do, we're working really hard. We have a new mayor um, and as well, and we are working so hard on transparency and on communication, getting a new website, getting all the information that we can on that website, but also making sure that I email out and we announce, I, I email out agenda packets. When an agenda packet comes to me, I send it out to my email distribution list and it gets posted. And then when the meeting's over, I do a report on what we decided, what the discussion was, what happened, why it was decided. Uh, so that I want people, it's like reading a novel, but drier. But, it, <laughs> but I want them to understand what's happening 
and what's going on because I, we hope that the more they understand, the more involved they'll be. We, we've also started doing a lot of town hall meetings. Right now, most of them are on water, and they're going to be a lot more on water. Uh, because obviously twice now in only a few years, our citizens have turned on their tap and discovered the harsh reality that nothing came out. And when that happens, they begin to get very interested in where does my water come from? Who's watching the use of that water? Why isn't it there? So the time is ripe for that. So communicating and, and casting a broader net and remembering it's not just those folks inside those small city limits, but it's the folks outside that make community. And um, they can be wonderful assets to research and volunteer and bring solutions. With a small town, with a small staff, you can't do a lot of the work yourself. It takes citizens digging into best practices and ordinances I'm gonna steal from Bernie and other places that we find out about uh, to bring into our own community. So it's, it's uh, as Donna said, it's all in, it's a lot of work. It's a full-time job, yep. but it's great. Right. And I think this is what we're finding now is that, you know, we, we've had a lot of division for a long time about climate issues and things, but the reality is when people can't get water out of the tap, right, when they're in freezing temperatures, it's very real. And, um, and, and what can we do now to actually fix the issues long-term instead of just constantly being responding. I have one more question I can ask, but I also want to open it up in case there are any burning questions in the audience for this, uh, these amazing women who I, I just keep listening to and imagining all of these things that didn't exist um, before these networks were tapped into. But anybody in the audience, do I see a hand? Otherwise, I'm going to close us out with a final question. No? Okay. Well, then, on that uh, topic of, of, you know, engaging people who might totally disagree on, on other issues, for example, um, both of you have seen some success in, in getting people to the table who, who didn't agree um, and who might have different philosophy or politics around these issues on a larger scale, but can actually make incremental changes together. Um, would you like to speak to how you've done that or, or some bright spots? Well, I will say, um, unfortunately, we have a, a system that you have to label yourself to run for an office. But I will tell you, if you don't drop the label when you become the, the uh, judge, then you've got a big problem. Because, you, you know, I think that's the most important thing is that uh, you leave the politics behind and you, you really work together with the community because everyone is equal. And uh, we've had great success with, with both parties in our community working together for the good of the people. And so if, I, if, if nothing else is to know that uh, sometimes you have to leave what you might think personally um, to the back and move forward for the good for, of the people. And I just want to say on another note, because one of the questions that Catherine has said that they might be posing is the idea that how do we get people engaged in the future and sustainability and conservation and environmental work when there's so many social struggles right now, trying to pay the bills, trying to make sure that they have jobs dealing with COVID. And I think one thing, again, that helps us avoid those political labels and philosophy is to focus on nature. It's sometimes daunting to us to watch the bulldozers come and to see the pavement and we think very large. We think about thousands of acres of land and billions of dollars and we have these big projects that we want to do. But just like health and stress management, when you can take these families under tremendous pressure and provide for them a park, some green space, some chance to see the night sky, some opportunity to be out. Research shows over and over again that our connection to nature is what limits stress, it's what relieves depression, it's what connects us, it's what feeds our souls. And I always think of that wonderful line from uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay, I'll be the gladdest thing under uh, the sun, I'll touch a hundred flowers and not pick one. That's conservation. And when we can teach a child that, to see the flower and all it offers and all it has for them, or an adult, 
and let it live there. It, it truly nurtures us. So the big projects we have are wonderful, but to build consensus, work on those little things, that means so much. That's what we all do. Thank you, Councilmember Connie Barron and former Judge Donna Klager. Thank you so much.